Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Family Academy, having conversations about race. My name is Felicia Hyland, and I am the coordinator for equity and engagement for the division. I'm excited about tonight's Academy and the opportunity to engage in this courageous conversation. Our focus tonight is to provide conversation starters and strategies to help families have meaningful discussions surrounding race. Tonight, the chat box will be open, so feel free to put questions in the chat. We will try to get to as many as we possibly can, but we are always available for follow-up. We are pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Haskins and Dr. Janice Parker from the College of William and Mary, who together with their team will facilitate tonight's discussion. Dr. Haskins, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Highland. And we are so glad to be here tonight to be able to talk about having conversations about race. So we're going to jump right in. Um, So our objectives, what we'd like um, to do tonight is first define and define race and racism um, so that we can have a common language. We are also going to discuss race and racism in schools. We will then identify what children tend to know about racism and race. We will also explore the benefits of talking about race and racism. We will describe the developmental needs as they relate to race and racism, and then provide age appropriate strategies for talking about race and racism with your children. So I always like to begin presentations with some type of narrative or poem or something that helps to illuminate the topic that we will be talking about and engaging um, around. So tonight we're going to start with just a, a brief um, reading of one snippet of The Anti-Racist Baby. And this is a book by Ibram Kendi that came out recently and it's designed to help cultivate and develop relationships around, with your children around race. And specifically, it is designed to help support the engagement with small children but the book can be utilized for everyone who wants to begin to develop an awareness um, about race and racism. So I'm going to go ahead and read a very small um, segment of the book. Anti-racist baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racial or anti-racial, excuse me, racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, we won't stop being so violent. So that will hopefully give us a little bit of a um, starter for the conversation that we're going to have and um, keep those things in mind. Hopefully you'll have some questions as we go um, through our presentation. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aisha Lee. I am a doctoral student at William Mary um, under Dr. Haskins as my advisor, and I'm excited to be here tonight with you guys um, to kind of get us um, started with the, the nitty gritty, really, of what we're here to talk about. We have to first define what is race and racism, right? Because how can you talk about something um, without first knowing what it is? So um, in defining race, um, we have this def definition here, a social construct that artificially divides people into distinct groups based on certain characteristics, such as physical appearance, particularly skin color, ancestral heritage, cultural affiliation, 
cultural history, ethnic classification, um, and then racial categories subsume, which means include ethnic groups. Um, and this definition is really interesting because if you, you kind of break down each part of it, it really shows you and tells you what race is. And first, it's a social construct, right? And even in the book um, that Dr. Haskins just read or the excerpt, um, it said that race is not real. It is not a, a real true thing, but it's something that artificially divides. Um, and so that's really important to keep in mind when we're talking about race, that it is this social thing, and it is an artificial thing. Um, and there's no real basis other than what we see in front of us um, that we're, we're basing this on. And another little piece that I do want to add about race um, is that the little bit of the history, which I think is really interesting to provide, is that um, it came about when people were just trying to understand why people look differently than them. Um, so I think that's something important that that categorization is important to remember as well. And then we have here a conversation that Dr. Haskins had with her six-year-old son. And I'll definitely turn that over to Dr. Haskins to further explain. Sure. So um, this is just a brief conversation um, that, that we had. Um, he's now nine, but this happened um, when he was in first grade. And he came home um, and he basically said, well, I saw him looking sad and I said, why the sad, sad face? And he said, mom, am I colored? And I said, what would make you ask that? You know, what happened? And he said, one of the kids in my class said I was colored. And I kind of paused and said, what? He said, he said, you're colored and started laughing. And I responded, well, it's not something to laugh about. Black is beautiful. We don't use the word colored. Um, but back 60 years ago, that was what African Americans in the United States were called. And so it was very clear to me early on um, that children begin to talk about race at a young age, kindergarten, first grade, that's just an example. And even before that, um, they begin to see difference and actually articulate it with one another and how they interact and communicate. Um, and so this was just a brief um, glimpse into, you know, one black boy's experience with race. So we'll move into what is racism? Yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Unity Walker and I am a doctoral student at the College of William and Mary and Dr. Haskins is my advisor. And again, uh, happy to be talking with you all this evening. So when talking about what racism is, you know, first we do have this definition and then there's a reading I have to go along with it. So when we're talking about what racism is, like how we're defining this, um, this would be the systemic subordination of members of targeted racial groups who have relatively little social power in the United States. And so that's compared to uh, white individuals, right? So we're talking about black individuals, uh, Latinx people, Native American individuals, um, Asian individuals, uh, compared to members of the agent racial group who have more social power. So in this instance, we're talking about white people. So the subordination is supported by the actions of individuals, cultural norms and values, and the institutional structures and practices of society. So what that's saying is that racism is not this necessarily overt act of uh, racist discrimination, but what it is is something uh, that can be more insidious. It's something that can go on beneath the um, it's something that can go on beneath the surface that occurs on the levels of our culture uh, and occurs in the values that are instilled in the ways that individuals interact with one another. Uh, and it carries over into our institutional structures and the things that we do as a society. So I do want to read something um, from White Fragility, 
for you all, uh, Robert D'Angelo's 2018 piece. It's just a few paragraphs that I think really captures this idea because we can't really talk about race without talking about white people and the position that they play in that position of power. So D'Angelo says, white people in North America live in a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race and white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. As a result, we are insulated from racial stress at the same time that we come to feel entitled to and deserving of our own advantage. Given how seldom we experience racial discomfort in a society we dominate, we haven't had to build our racial stamina. Socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority that we are either unaware of or can never admit to ourselves, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. We consider a challenge to our racial worldviews as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of stress, racial stress, is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. These emotions include anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence and withdrawal from the stress inducing situation. And then she goes on to say, when it, uh, reflecting on this, she says, I began to see what I think of as the pillars of whiteness, the unexamined beliefs that prop up our racial responses. I could see the power of the belief that only bad people were racist, as well as how individualism allowed white people to exempt themselves from the forces of socialization. I could see how we are taught to think about racism as only discrete acts committed by individual people, rather than as a complex interconnected system. And in light of so many white expressions of resentment towards people of color, I realize that we see ourselves as entitled to and deserving of more than people of color deserve. I saw our investment in a system that serves us. I also saw how hard we worked to deny all this and how defensive we became when these dynamics were named. In turn, I saw how our defensiveness maintained a racial status quo. Personal reflections on my own racism a more critical view of media and other aspects of culture and exposure to the perspectives of many brilliant and patient mentors of color all helped me to see how the pillars of racism worked. It became clear that if I believed that only bad people who intended to hurt others because of race ever do so, I would respond with outrage to any suggestion that I was involved in racism. Of course, that belief would make me feel falsely accused of something terrible, and of course, I would want to defend my character. I came to see the way that we are taught to define racism makes it virtually impossible for white people to understand it. Given our racial insul insulation, racial insulation, coupled with misinformation, any suggestion that we are complicit in racism is a kind of unwelcome and insulting shock to the system. If, however, I understand racism as a system into which I was socialized, I can receive feedback on my problematic racial patterns as a helpful way to support my learning and growth. One of the greatest social fears for a white person is being told that something we have said or done is racially problematic. Yet when someone lets us know we have just done such a thing, rather than respond with gratitude and relief, we often respond with anger and denial. Such moments can be experienced as something valuable, even if temporarily painful, only after we accept that racism is unavoidable and that it is impossible to completely escape having developed problematic racial assumptions and behaviors. So that's, that's what D'Angelo has to say about that. And what that looks like, we have this iceberg, right? So we think of racism as hate speech, hate groups, hate rallies. We have lynching, racially motivated violence, all of the overt explicit acts of racism 
that we hear, that we see, that, that's covered in media. But really, it goes much deeper than that. It's this idea of making racist jokes at family get-togethers. It's saying things like, I don't see race. It's taking inaction or not taking action and, and defaulting to the side of inaction when we do see issues of oppression coming up, when we do see issues of discrimination, when we do see racism. That silence is overt racism and is part of the iceberg of racism. Um, even acting from places of good intentions, that's not good enough because we can be acting with good intentions and still hurt people and still commit racist acts have it in our speech, all sorts of things. So, so long as we have that defensiveness, this iceberg will continue to be as deep as it is. And so by defining racism in this way, it helps us to see how deep this actually goes and hopefully we can overcome it. Uh, that and the meritocracy that we believe as a society um, that eliminates that discussion of race. Dr. Parker, I think you're muted. I apologize. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we even have this conversation about race and racism, particularly with our children and adolescents. So in general, when it comes to race and racism in schools, we know that it impacts um, students of color um, in a number of ways. So one, we know that it impacts their school bonding. So it disrupts their relationships with teachers, their peers, and even their relationships with administrators. At a more internal level, we also know that it impacts their self-esteem. A lot of children who experience racism, prejudice, and discrimination at school are more likely to doubt themselves to doubt their capabilities, their self-efficacy, um, and also experience a host of social emotional challenges that can ultimately impact their achievement in school. We also know that racism at a systemic level in schools, um, it creates inequitable achievement, school discipline, where we know that minority students, particularly black students, are more likely to be disciplined and receive harsh punishment and we also know that race and racism in schools, it creates inequitable opportunities. The research um, is quite clear that individual students of color, in particular Black students and um, Latino students, are more likely or less likely to be, to, grant, to be granted access in things like gifted education, AP, college prep coursework, um, compared to their white peers. And so a lot of times we think when it comes to racism, um, you know, we can't have those conversations with younger kids. Um, they're too young to understand. They don't know. So let's wait. Well, the literature shows us that by age three, children can actually um, express explicit forms of racism. Um, by age five, children of color are conscious of existing stereotypes about their groups. Um, and this can have a negative and profound impact on these children. And then by age eight, we also know that white kids tend to learn that it is socially unacceptable to engage in more of those explicit forms of racism. So if you think back to that iceberg, those things at the top, but because that's mainly where the conversation centers around, um, they end up, we know that the literature shows that they also may exhibit some of those more implicit forms of prejudice, um, you know, even when it's not done in a malicious way, because we don't have the comprehensive conversations around both the top of the iceberg and the bottom part of the iceberg. So what are our children saying? Um, so this is a dialogue that I had with my four-year-old son, and it shows that even kids um, at a young age are trying to figure it all out in terms of what does it mean, race, racism, and all of these things. So in this conversation, um, unsolicited, my son woke us up one morning, my husband and I, and said, Mommy, guess what? Um, and of course, I said, what? And he said, there's someone in my class who's brown just like me. And my reaction was, really, that's great. And then he went on to name another student who was brown like him. 
Um, and then ultimately he said, well, is brown good, is, right? That's a good thing, right? Um, and of course we affirmed it, but in that moment, he was again beginning to kind of question and wonder, um, this is a good thing because he recognizes that he is different than most of the kids in his class. So what are our kids saying? Um, again, we know that kids are talking about racism. They talk about it in different ways. Um, they know to varying degrees. Um, so the literature shows that when it comes to white students, they talk about it in various ways. At times, they may talk about it from a colorblind standpoint where they may say things like, well, I don't see race, we're all equal. Um, they might also talk about it in a way where they explicitly deny that racism even exists. So this quote at the bottom here is a quote from a student participant in a study where they more or less just said, you know, there's no longer a problem anymore. We're past that. You know, after Martin Luther King um, happened, um, after that African-American woman sat on the bus, who happened to be the wrong person that the student identified, um, is no longer, you know, a thing of today. Things have changed. We also know that sometimes they talk about it in a way that perpetuates stereotypes, um, in a way that um, addresses it as an individual issue. So, you know, racism is just about interpersonal interactions with people. And then there's some research that shows that, you know, some white students may talk about it as a systemic issue. Um, and so this particular quote was from a white participant in a study who more or less identified that there are structures, powers in place um, that creates inequitable opportunities at a more systemic level for minority populations. When it comes to um, students of color, the literature also shows that they talk about it also in various ways, but they tend to talk about it in a way where they describe how it impacts them and their experiences both in and out of the school context. So just as um, the literature shows that white students might have some misperception, I'm sorry, may misperceive who black students are, who Latino students are, other students are, um, we know that students of color are aware that those stereotypes exist um, and they are, they are aware that it causes differential treatment once they enter the school building. They may also talk about it from a colorblind mindset. Again, we're all the same. Um, there is a lot of research that shows that students of color tend to also talk about what it means for their mental health. And that goes back to what I mentioned before around the social emotional implications um, of racism in schools. And so this quote here is from a black male student, um, adolescent who talked about feeling angry and resentment and hurt um, when he entered the school building and ultimately just kind of questioned, why are we treated this way? And then just as we know with some white students as well, um, it's not uncommon for black students, students of color, um, Latinx students and so forth to also talk about racism as a systemic issue, um, which reflects denied opportunities in school as well as in society. So this is a quote of an African-American student who recognized um, that there were some discrepancies as it relates to opportunities within her school setting. So this kind of sums up why it's so important that we have these conversations with our children about race and racism. And more or less, children are um, thinking about these things. They're talking about these things. And if we as adults are not there to guide them, to engage with them, they begin to kind of fill in the gaps on their own. And as you can see, the gaps might reflect a range of conceptualizations that might be short-sighted and harmful to um, students of color and then just students in general as it relates to their interactions with each other. And so we're not talking about it explicitly as adults, as parents, um, then where are they getting the information from? So they tend to go to the news, social media. Um, I read in one study, students were talking about it via Snapchat. Um, they were talk, they get, they get that information from each other. And again, because we're not having those conversations at a widespread um, kind of basis with adults, 
they're kind of filling in these gaps, which may not necessarily be accurate. And so ultimately, it's important for us to have these explicit conversations with our children and adolescents to help them understand and recognize differences that exist, to respect and appreciate those differences, to break down stereotypes, to build empathy and compassion for each other. Um, we also know that it can help people or children see that the world around them is unjust, is unfair. So looking at things at a systemic level. And then finally, um, it gives them permission to know that they can do something about it and they can be empowered to create change. So in order to be able to have these conversations with our kids, we need to understand where they are in terms of their development. And this looks different depending on the age of your kids. And you can see from the examples that Dr. Haskins and Dr. Parker provided that, um, that some of these conversations can be very concrete and uh, just based in like a, a basic understanding of what's going on. These conversations of like, um, am I a person of color? They, they barely start to emerge um, at those earlier points. And so in those early stages, um, children are focused in uh, on their relationships with their parents. They're focused in on their connections with their friends. And really, it's about their emerging sense of identity and the ways in which they get their wants and needs met by the world around them. They're very responsive to these systems of um, rewards and punishment. Uh, and so being treated unfairly on the basis of race is something that can be perceived as I'm being punished because I'm bad. And th those sorts of sentiments can be internalized because it's a very concrete operational uh, perspective for, for um, or it's, it's, it's very, uh, sorry, it's very concrete for them in that way. They, they see this as, um, they see this as something of, I am this thing and um, I am usually treated poorly or I am punished uh, when I do something wrong. Um, and so I am doing something wrong because of, my race, right? And so that idea um, essentially starts to develop a, as they go through their process and, and reach, um, start reaching into adolescence. They start to realize that people make these rules uh, that tell them what is right and wrong and that carries over into race. They can start to see uh, the rights and wrongs of their society based on um, the, the race that they are. Right, like we heard about how white children react in um, racial situations and they realize about these instances of overt versus covert racism and that sort of thing. It starts to become more complex and more nuanced as children move into adolescence. Uh, so those conversations might look different. So once they start moving into adolescence, um, children really become their relationships. So they are their connections with other people. Um, so when they are in that like five to 12 age bracket, their friendships and things like that are important, but teenagers, their worlds revolve around their connections with other people. And so the way that they are treated based on their different identities really affects their self-esteem uh, for whatever those identities are. But one of the most prevalent identities tends to be race. And it's something that's not often talked about. Um, it, it does come up, but it is something that, um, is something that goes under the radar sometimes. Like we said, it becomes one of those instances in which um, people learn that we don't have these overt discussions about this topic. So it's something that, that just sits underneath the surface. But they enter into this, this stage of being able to think abstractly, to think about concepts of justice, fairness, equity, and what that really means to them. And it won't be until after they've, their brains have fully matured and they've moved out of adolescence that they're really able to sit and process all of what that means, but they're starting to do that once they're teenagers. So in that, um, in that experience, they start to look at their own beliefs, their own um, moral values and what it is that is important to them. Uh, so in that we start to see 
um, even at this age, we start to see conversations about race, around advocacy, around um, defining what that means for them and redefining what it means on the social level. Um, this stuff can really impact individuals and it does affect mental health. It does affect um, outcomes in school in terms of overall well-being and um, it's something that we need to be aware of uh, from a developmental standpoint when we're having these conversations with our kids is that this can range from the simple um, just like concrete explanations to things that can really get into fundamental meaning making stuff. So that takes us into our strategies. So how should we address race and racism with our children? So we're going to start by looking at our, our, our babies, our lower elementary um, students. And this is really K through second or third grade, um, depending on the child's developmental level. And I will say, as we go through the strategies, while we have broken them into um, developmental kind of um, groups, it may be that the strategies can be utilized across all, depending on that child's need, um, depending on their developmental um, just awareness and, 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 and needs. And so feel free to utilize them as needed. Um, so the first one, it's pretty um, self-explanatory, but follow your child's lead. You know, if if your child brings it up, um, you know, go with them um, and, and be curious. Um, you know, keep it simple in terms of how you actually talk about it, especially we're talking here about our K through um, second or third graders, you know, so give them a simple explanation in terms of what race is, you know, it's something that we have you know, utilized in this country to um, identify people, to provide some type of structured cate categorization. Um, it doesn't mean that anyone is better than anyone else. Um, it's something for us to embrace and celebrate. Um, don't downplay it and say, you know, it's nothing or, you know, we, we're all the same. Um, and you know, use things like picture books. The one I used um, at the beginning of the session is a good starting place. Um, we'll also list them um, at the end of the presentation as well um, to tell the story if you feel so uncomfortable with bringing it up. Um, simple things like buying toys and books that reflect diversity of race and ethnicity is also something that you know you can start doing. And that can help prompt conversation around celebrating differences. Um, and then using the construct of fairness is something that children at this age understand. You know, they understand the notion of sharing and what's fair and what's not fair. And, you know, you can talk about like, well, you know, everyone should receive, you know, the, the same amount, you know, relative, of course, we're talking K through second or third grade, and that makes sense for them. And we know, you know, we're not talking about equality, we're talking about equity, but just from a developmental perspective, they can understand that, you know, what's not fair is, you know, someone getting more than someone else. Um, and so using that type of language is um, really useful with this age group. Now, as you move into your upper elementary, and this is typically, um, you can include third grade as well, um, and it can go all the way up to sixth grade, um, even though we know sixth grade is, is middle school, but for in terms of developmental needs, um, this could still fit with their developmental needs. So number one, being mindful of previous, um, of the previous, like I said, um, and you can utilize those. Um, and then talk about social media. So Dr. Parker brought this up is where people are getting, where children are getting their information. Social media is a big one. You know, we see children at this age, some of them do have, you know, access to a, a cell phone. They may have, um, you know, most of our kids are on computers now. I mean, even though we try to provide oversight, you know, there are things that pop up, you know, um, and, you know, things that maybe even seem innocent, but, you know, may actually 
influence how they're seeing um, different people in their lives. Or even, you know, if you see only white people, you know, on commercials um, or what have you, it may create this thought that, oh, you know, maybe there's something better about being white or something, you know, negative about being a person of color. So we have to be mindful of even those types of things that seem so innocent, um, which is one of the reasons why we focus, you know, in, you know, I was a school counselor for a number of years, so much on making sure that we provide diverse, you know, um, books and opportunities for students to engage around individuals and people that look dif different than them and have had different life experiences. So also, you know, ask your child, you know, what are children saying at, sc at school? You know, how are people talking about differences? Um, and then be open. You know, when they start to share, you know, don't immediately kind of rush in with what you think, you know, and um, shut down the conversation. If they say something like, oh, I don't see difference, you know, we're all the same, you know, um, instead of saying, no, 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 we're, you know, don't use, you know, we don't want to use that language, you know, ask them about, you know, tell me a little bit about that, you know, um, what, you know, where did that come from? You know, when did you start feeling that way? And really begin to have a conversation because if you can be open with them and begin that conversation, it goes a long way in actually continue, being able to continue those conversations later on. And then modeling it. You know, at this age, our kids are looking at us. You know, I have a, a nine-year-old, he's in third grade and he's looking at everything I do. And, you know, if he sees that I'm embracing, you know, people that, you know, don't look like me, I'm standing up for, you know, um, standing up in, in against racism and, and things like that, you know, that becomes also a part of what he understands as you know, a, a norm within our family, within our community, um, and is really even an expectation. And I already said, celebrate differences. And then, you know, use real life experiences. You know, talk about times when, you know, maybe you went to the library and, you know, um, they were able to play with children that look different than them. And, you know, talk about the fact that, and celebrate you know, so many times we act like, you know, race is something to not be celebrated and difference is not to be celebrated and not to even be um, identified. Um, but really identify for them those real, those times in their life where they've been exposed to differences and be able to talk about, about that with them. And then um, catch them, catch embracing others and differences and celebrate. So catch them in the moment. Um, and, and let them know that, oh, you, it was so great to see, you know, how you em embraced and supported, you know, um, all the children that were here, even though you all had different backgrounds and had different life experiences. You know, my, my son loves to hear about people that are, are different and he wants to know, what does that mean? And, you know, we, we have those conversations and we talk about what it means and what it doesn't mean. And it's really intriguing to see his, the wheels turning. You know, he always doesn't know what to say, but he has questions. And, and so for this age group, a part of their development is really wanting to know. And so that's really, when I think about all of the strategies that we've provided here, a big part of it is them wanting to know and us as parents being able to have questions. And if we don't have answers, that's okay too. And let them know that, you know, don't try to budget, you know, um, let them know you're not sure, but let's find out together. Um, and that kind of leads us right into the middle and high school age um, and that's when we really start to get into that adolescent age that um, unity discussed the adolescent development um, so as dr parker already said and dr haskins um, they already know right they already know what's out there they already know about race they've seen what racism is um, they might not be able to name it just yet but they've definitely seen it so find out what they already know and find out what they've seen um, 
is really important to, to start at to kind of know where to go from there. Um, and then ask the questions when race is presented on TV or at an event. So um, like Dr. Hassan was saying, it's, it's in the media, it's everywhere. You know, you have um, TV shows that might have very stereotypical um, characters or even commercials that might have stereotypical characters and maybe point that out. Like, hmm, that's interesting. I'm wondering what, you're, what you think about that. Um, that also kind of gives them a sense of agency and, and lets them know that you care about their opinion, which is um, which kind of opens the door to more conversation. Um, and it's really important for an adolescent who's trying to develop their own identity, right? Um, to have their parent ask them, like, what do you think? Um, and then discuss those stereotypes that you're seeing, right? So asking them and then discussing, well, what does that mean, right? Where did you get that stereotype from? Um, to kind of you know flush out um, what what how they're making sense of the world around them, and then of course um, I think Dr. Haskins already alluded to this, but finding those diverse experiences, um, you know, and that can be literature, a lot of literature, books, anti-racist baby, um, just exposing them to different things other than the mainstream and what they're used to. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I mean, this isn't, this isn't easy, right? And so, um, especially when you get to this adolescent age, that's when you start to get a lot of pushback. Like, I don't, my friends aren't doing that, so I don't want to do it. Um, and then, you know, as parents, we have to say, or have some type of reason of, because they're always going to ask why, 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 why? You have to have some type of reason of, well, this is why, right? I want to expose you to these experiences so you can know what's out there. Um, because, you know, even though our town, and I came from a very, um, I'll, you know, quite frankly, a, a, a very white neighborhood, right, even though the people in our town um, look all like us, right, when you get out into the world, into the workforce, into, you know, whatever you want to do, not everyone is going to look like that, and so we need to start to learn now what that means, how, how to navigate that, um, and then, of course, encouraging them to find ways to get involved whether it's virtual or um, in person and involved meaning advocacy. And I know that word sometimes can scare people, but um, advocacy in terms of just maybe going on some um, discussion boards, right? And, you know, providing some knowledge that they might've learned from the reading that you gave them or the book that you gave them. Um, educating people and, you know, it doesn't even have to be a protest, but if they wanna protest, support them <laughs> in that protest. Um, and then again, helping them to join a book, book club. And I wasn't a reader when I was uh, in middle school or high school. So honestly, if you would have handed me a book and said, here, read this for your development, I would have been like, no, I'm not going to do that. But I think um, what's important about families and, and being a parent is you can always make things a group event, right? And so that kind of goes back to that point of autonomy and identity and individuality. Um, they want to be seen, a middle schooler, high schooler, adolescent, want to be seen as an individual person. Um, they don't want you to just say, this is what I want you to do because you are my child. What they, want to, what they want to hear is, we're going to do this together because I see you as a person and as a um, human being that we need to learn and grow together, if that makes sense. So do a book club, right? If my mom would have came to me and said, let's read this book together and let's talk about it and have family meetings about it, I would have done it. Um, my, again, I might have given some pushback, but I would have done it. <laughs> um, so those, those are just a few simple ways to engage the adolescent. But overall, again, like I said, this is a hard thing to do, but don't freak out about it. Um, can I take a, deep, a few deep breaths? I mean, if we want to, we can have a whole another conversation about the mental health, you know, tricks and tips that you can do to kind of calm yourself down. But um, it is a big deal, but it's also not. It's a conversation, right? Um, so you, you don't have to kind of hype this thing up in your head. And it's okay to make mistakes as well. Um, I, but what's important about making mistakes is going back and correcting them, especially with an adolescent or a middle schooler. If you go up to that child and say, I made a mistake, they're going to, I mean, they're going to see you as a person. They're going to humanize you. And once they get to that adolescent stage, they usually dehumanize parents. So by saying, I made a mistake, you're going to be a human to them and they're going to be able to hear you that much more. Um, 
again, having those new cultural experiences, Dr. Haskins and I both said that, and call it out when you see it. Um, it's, it's small things, um, but when you see those small things, whether it be how someone is treated in a grocery store or um, something that you saw on TV like, or in the media, mm, that's, that's, this is what that is, right? Remember when we were talking about racism the other week? This is a perfect example. Um, and then modeling diverse relationships. We're telling you guys to get your children involved in diverse things, but you guys should do it too, right? Um, if not only to model, but also to just understand what that experience is like um, and broaden your own horizons. And then also discussing privilege. And I feel like you can't really discuss racism without discussing privilege. Um, and what um, the dominant majority with the white um, community has in, in terms of race, um, racism that the minority community does not have. Um, but I, I do say when you discuss privilege, be um, aware that feelings of guilt um, and shame will often come with that, especially for those children and, and be prepared to deal with that. Be prepared to be open about your own guilt and shame and recognizing privilege. Ask questions, um, be open, be honest about your own journey, your own growth. Schedule time to talk often. Again, going back to those book clubs, I mean, let's all sit down, family meeting, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let's talk about it. And then again, reflect on your own bias. Um, and this work takes your own work, right? Um, so to do the per personal bias reflections, um, these are just some prompts that we will we'll provide um, or we've laid out for you. Um, the first time I became aware of differences was when, and this might take some time for you guys, guys to kind of sit with and, and think about, um, but more often than not, everybody can think of a time that they became aware of those differences. What did that mean? First off, what was the difference? What did it mean? What automatic um, thoughts came into your head about what that meant, right? When we go back to categorization, um, when you realize that somebody was in a different category than you, what narratives, what things did you say about that person versus what you said about yourself? Um, like for me as a black woman, when I recognized that, I said, oh, that means I'm less than and they are better than. Um, so recognizing that um, those, those thoughts as I was growing up, my parents taught me that people who were different from us were, my feeling would be scary, right? A lot of people are taught that people different than you are scary. Um, and not in a sense of like, boo, scared, but like, you don't want to associate with people different than you because that's just not for us, right? It kind of almost is a fear response. Um, as I was growing up, my parents taught me that people who were like us were safe, that would be my feeling. Um, so again, going through these prompts um, to kind of really um, flush out what does race and racism mean for me as a parent, and then you will be in such a better position to um, uh, do that with your children. And maybe even asking some of these um, questions to your children as well, especially your middle and high schoolers, because they can more so handle, handle that type of inquiry. Okay, so we have here just a few of our, um, a few of the resources that, um, you know, we have either used ourselves to provide, um, you know, information to people or just websites that we know provide really strong materials for parents. Um, so um, I'm sure there are others, but of course we have PBS, Kids Health, org is a great one, the Parent Coalition, Tolerance.org, Healthy Children, and then Embrace Race.org. So if you want some additional like resources, tips, these are going to be some great places to go to, um, to find those. I did not mean to do that. So when it comes to books, there are a plethora of books um, that range from 
you know, different topics, different race and ethnicities, um, what racism may look like, um, self-awareness, self-love, so many different topics for both children and adolescents. So it was hard for me to pick a few and identify, okay, this one is and this one here. Um, instead, I just, well, I provided, um, we provided links for you guys to go to um, some popular websites where you'll see some of the same books that are mentioned and noted, so in a cross-reference format. Um, so, you know, peruse through these different websites, see what's there. Um, the great thing about a lot of these um, books that are highlighted is there is a, synop a synopsis around what the book entails, um, what it addresses. So um, by all means, you know, use these different sites as an avenue for you to see what, for you to see what's there um, to determine what books might be most beneficial for your family. And they might be beneficial at different stages. Um, this is a marathon, it's not a race. There's different things that are gonna come, different conversations that might happen depending on where you are um, in your family, where your family is in the conversations about racism. Um, so the good thing is you can choose these books at any time. All right, so I think we have a few minutes for questions. And I did see one um, question in the chat. Um, and Miss Vanessa Jones was asking, we had any um, recommendations for how to respond to um, her son who um, came home and was talking about the fact mm -hmm. that um, someone said black people are more likely to be criminals because there are so many more black people in prisons. So I'm gonna put that to the panel. Um, I, I know she also said that she launched into a discussion about systemic racism. Um, I, I would say I can start and then others that might jo join in. Um, I think the first thing um, to, to add to, I know um, I'm glad that you did begin some conversation around systemic racism. And I think that you can also, you know, um, you know, ask him what his thoughts were about it. You know, when, when it was said to him, you know, what did he think? Um, you know, how did he feel about it? Um, you know, what does those types of conversations um, how does that impact his relationships? You know, what did he, how did he respond, you know, to the student um, that, that said it? Um, and even thinking, you know, helping him maybe think, because you said seventh grade, so maybe th helping him think of ways that he could respond, um, you know, moving forward. Like, what might he say, you know, the next time that something like that is said? Um, since it seems like, you know, he came to you and, you know, maybe felt uncomfortable um, with what was said. And I'll jump in um, and I'll say something that is really important to remember about adolescents is um, they are really, really good at tuning out um, lectures. So I know um, when they, when a teen or an adolescent says something that's really appalling or really hurtful, um, we tend to want to jump into, okay, this is why. No, 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 no. Um, but they'll tune out really fast, right? And the conversation around racism or systemic racism will become, um, they will associate it with this negative feeling of, I can't talk about that because when I do, then my mom or my dad or my caregiver goes into this rant and this lecture and I start to feel more shame and more guilt. Um, about about this the subject. So what what we want to do instead is really open up the conversation instead of shutting it down with immediate facts and information. Facts and information are great, but we, you might want to kind of soften the blow with let's like Dr. Aston said, let's have a conversation about this um, and really get at the root of how does that make them feel? Because I don't believe that racism is a a human thing um, and it, I think, do believe it goes against human in instincts and so if you guide the child or your adolescent to sit with how that felt they can kind of come to their own conclusions about this isn't this doesn't feel good 
and then have a discussion about that. And I think too, um, because a lot of, you know, the conversation is, so what happens when they go back to school and they engage in these exchanges? Um, so definitely I echo what, what Dr. Haskin said about give him a couple of talking points, you know, things that he can share. I also think it's important for us to recognize that conversations about racism can cause tension, right? And so I also believe that there's a point where you say, you know, you may just plant seeds and that's it, as opposed to getting in the situation where, you know, they're engaging in, you know, heated exchanges for someone who might not be at a space where they're willing to listen and willing to hear what's happening. Um, so planting the seeds can be a part of that conversation where you say, here are some talking points. If a person responds in this way, meaning they try to debate you, um, they're not listening and they talk down, then that might be a point for you to walk away and maybe um, perhaps choose, you know, other people to interact with or not engage um, in an extensive way. I, I personally like the idea of finding a topic or, or finding a framework um, that your child's most likely to be able to have that discussion in. Mm -hmm. So like if your child's really into history, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could talk about like, well, let's look at the history of that. If, if there's some avenue that is more palatable to them, that's going to engage their interest over something that's like difficult to discuss, it can be a pathway of least resistance because it brings out that response in us, right? Like that's what it sounds like. It brought up that immediate response in you to say, we have these systemic issues. I'm impassioned about this. I need to tell you like what's happening. Um, but like finding that way, um, like the other panelists have shared of like allowing that space to deescalate and being able to engage. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's important. So like, I, I, I actually really like that question. So thank you. Um, I did see um, that we did have another question as well that was talking about uh, terms. Well, it wasn't really a, a question, but as much of a statement about the importance of making sure that we don't throw terms around lightly. And I think that's one of the primary points that we were really trying to highlight when we were defining race and racism was so that we were, um, on the same page of how we're defining uh, that, that, that term, right? And so when individuals see racism as something that is like an individual act, like something that they have done uh, that, that makes them racist, that's, that's what I'm seeing as a theme in, in the words that you're sharing. Um, somebody who commits sexual assault, somebody who's a bully, somebody who's racist, that's a label that's attached to a person that uh, accuses them of some sort of negative act. And immediately our egos flare up. We become super defensive and we, and we, we just kind of wall that off and say, nope, 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 that can't be me because society, socially, like on a social level, we've come to say that those terms are like super negative, right? Like that's a thing that we can't be because that challenges our character. But in this discussion, in this context, when we're talking about what racism is, it goes beyond the individual level. I would argue that everyone is racist to some degree. We all have biases and prejudices that affect our behaviors and that hurt others, right? And so as we sustain that and we're unaware of it, then it continues to happen, right? So if we're, we start to become aware of the fact that racism occurs on a systemic level, that racism exists in our policy making, in the way that our law enforcement works, in the way that educational opportunities are offered, in the way that our socioeconomic structure is built, then we start to see that that's how that gives rise to these individual acts of racism that come through us all. And so when we talk about defining racism, that's what we mean. It, it's not this act of this individual perniciousness, which it is, it can be, um, but it is something that occurs on a structural level throughout our entire nation that comes out through individuals. And I'll I just see, add that go ahead. racism is, this, is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as prejudice 
um, as well as discrimination and antagonism against someone from a different race um, based on a belief that people might have about that race. And so it's, it is, racism is a broader term that includes these other, if you want to say types of racism, um, but other types of racism. Um, so I think, you know, yes, we, we are trying to define um, the terms and it's important for us to, you know, look at things um, to make sure that we're giving a very clear um, message. Um, and so I'm glad we're able to just kind of, um, you know, go back over that and ensure that hopefully there's clarity there. And Dr. Haskins, I noticed that there were two additional mm -hmm. questions in the chat. If it's possible, can I have one panelist answer each question um, before we wrap up? The first question says, um, my son pointed out last year that there are mostly white kids in the visions class classes. What can I say to help him reflect on and understand the reasons for that? Yeah, so this is one of those things, um, and I guess I can answer it because it's actually a question that, you know, I've often posed and, and had conversations about. Um, so, so the Gifted and Talented Program in Williamsburg, James City County, um, overwhelmingly has people that are white. Um, and that is, you know, and it's probably a, a national um, it reflects the national demographics as well. Um, and again, I'm, I'm in many ways heartened to hear that, you know, your, your son was aware, you know, and so, um, and I think I would, I would start there. And I know that's not a part of your, your question, but I would definitely start there with just, you know, letting him know that you know, so glad that he is seeing things that seem to be um, where there seem to be disparities. Um, and I think you can have a conversation around, you know, the fact that there are some systemic issues within our country. I mean, as a seventh grader, um, I would, you know, um, believe that he would be able to understand that, you know, that there are some systemic issues in our country that um, put black and brown children at a disadvantage. And it often starts very early in, you know, pre-K, pre preschool. Um, and it impacts, you know, their ability to have access and opportunity to some of these types of programs, you know? And so that typically is one of the reasons, there are multiple reasons, but I would start there um, and, you know, again, you know, question him around just how he's feeling about that experience and being, you know, um, in a classroom where diversity doesn't seem to be embraced or a program where diversity doesn't seem to be embraced. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. And you said you had another question. Yeah, this last question, I'm not sure if we will really be able to answer, but it's what do you say to a teacher who refers to the color brown in the classroom setting as an ugly color and an unhappy color? I'll answer. Um, okay. I think it starts with trying to figure out what the motives behind it was, at least how I'm reading it, it seems like that that was something that was said without necessarily reflecting on the implications of that statement. Um, and so if that's the case, you know, pull the teacher to, to the side, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation around why what they said um, is harmful and could be detrimental to students, both students of color especially, who are probably going to internalize that to mean that there's something wrong with me, that I'm an unhappy color, but then also why it creates a narrative um, that makes people feel othered and perhaps empowers um, students in the dominant group. So white students 
um, to feel like they are inferior. And so, again, just the conversation around the implications of that particular statement for all students and how it can perpetuate um, those um, interrupted relationships and then larger systemic issues over time um, because it creates a belief system, a thought process around um, that particular notion. Can I add something really quickly? And I would just say, you know, this is why it's so important for training um, of our teachers um, so that these types of things, you know, hopefully don't happen. You know, I know they still do, but um, so that there's, you know, some specific concrete ways of talking about, I mean, colors. I mean, that might be, you know, I mean, I remember when somebody said, you know, find something black. And I remember a teacher, and this is when I was in school, held up a, <clears throat> a shoe and pointed to the bottom of the sole. And I thought, you know, as a child, you don't really realize the impact. But now as an adult, reflecting on that, that that was the only thing black that she could identify in the classroom with the sole of a shoe. And what that might have, you know, brought up in children, and not even the black and brown children in the classroom, but also the white children and what that might have meant. You know, so just, you know, that's my last bit is, is in terms of just really making sure teachers are receiving um, culturally responsive and sensitivity training. It reminds me a lot of, uh, that that's a really great example of that idea of what is and isn't racism, because somebody could have said that brown is an ugly color without having any intention of that being a racist statement, but it still was. And it's not up to the person who made that statement to determine whether or not that was racist, right? It's up to the person who heard that. It's up to the person who felt that. Because if that hit them on a level that they felt in their identity, then that means that it was a racist experience for them. And that's something that becomes internalized. So I, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I agree. I think we've covered all of our um, questions in our chat. I want to thank all of our participants for joining. I really want to thank the panelists for um, number one, saying yes when I asked if uh, we could engage in this collaboration. And number two, for sharing your expertise uh, with the the individuals who had an opportunity to join us. This will be posted on the, our YouTube channel for the division. So I'm sure that more individuals will be able to engage in uh, this conversation as well. I thank you for your courageousness um, in leading this discussion. So I think that that is it for this evening, unless we have anything else from our panelists. Is there anything that you would like to share before we close? Um, no, other than, I mean, I, I have my our references here. Um, the other thing is, I guess, you can contact us if you have any questions. Um, if there are things that come up for you after the session, feel free to reach out to um, Dr. Parker and myself. Um, you can also um, reach out to Aisha and Unity um, if there are things that you just want to maybe touch base about or... Um, find some strategies or resources. So. All right. With that, we're going to say good night and I thank you again.